Recording in progress. Cool. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So lecture four. This is going to be our last uh, last lecture on technologies. Um, so we've covered most of the fossil fuel and non-fossil fuel specifically for electricity generation. Uh, and so today we're going to focus on transportation technologies and fuels, um, which is kind of the the other sort of large uh, sector consuming uh, fuels. So let's see if we're here. All right. So fossil fuels for transportation. Um, we've talked about coal, which is the, the most common solid form of fossil fuels. And we've talked about uh, natural gas, which is the most common gaseous form for fossil fuels. And so transportation uh, uses uh, petroleum, which is your sort of most common liquid form. Um, so this is a plot of crude oil prices, right? So we've looked at sort of how, how much coal costs, how much natural gas costs. You guys are probably most familiar with this. Um, either through the price of gasoline or for the energy nerds, people who keep track of the price of oil. Um, fairly volatile over the last um, last couple of decades, right? Until, um, and, and even more so very recently. Okay, so extraction. Um, you guys may have seen these oil derricks before, right? And so this is kind of, huh? Not a derrick. Oh, sorry. What is this called? Pump jack. Pump jack. All right. Well, uh, okay. So maybe you can clarify for me. What is the oil derrick? In the olden days, so nowadays you have derricks on drilling rigs, so like a structure that looks like a lattice. Okay. Like climbs really high. So yeah. What's called the derrick is like a lattice that's going to climb high. So the old the way that we use it there to offer the but now this is just simply a pump jack. Got it. Okay. So the mechanics of the pump jack uh, looks something like this. Essentially, you're going to drill down and you have um, a series of valves that essentially work to um, bring up the oil. Uh, you may have seen you may have seen these uh, even in, in places in California. Um, if you're if you're driving down the five, like you can you can see some of these near um, like just north of of LA County. So types of oil um, classified as conventional and unconventional. So this is going to mirror um, what we were talking about with extraction of of natural gas, right? And so conventional oil. Um, so typically highest quality, lightest oil flows from underground uh, reservoirs. Uh, so when we think about extraction of, of these fuels, um, these tend to be sort of the cheapest to extract. And as we think about sort of the resource availability and how that relates to the cost uh, of, of the oil, you know, these things come into play as you think about um, economics of this fuel, uh, and and scarcity out of it as you as you use sort of more and more and so unconventional oils um, harder to get at heavier um, often uh, tar like so the recovery of the oil and refining of the oil into the forms that we typically use um, requires a lot more investments uh, and so that's where sort of your your extra costs kind of comes into play um, and so. When once you start getting into unconventional oils, right, you're thinking about how your fuel competes with um, with other resources, um, and that becomes less competitive. And so, most of the production today is is coming from conventional oil. So this is a supply curve um, that that talks about this uh, exact issue. Uh, and so what you can see here, uh, as you move uh, left to right, it's essentially like 
what resources are we going to um, extract first? Um, and once you're sort of done with everything there, you move on to other sort of other types of um, fuel resources, right? And so this here is essentially what we've already consumed. This is our global supply of conventional oil. Uh, and then you can get oil from things like enhanced oil recovery, these unconventional oils that I was just mentioning. Um, and then sin fuels are basically um, artificially producing, um, producing these oils. And then on the y-axis, right, as you go to sort of more unconventional um, and sin fuels, it becomes more and more expensive um, to produce. And so the, the supply curve looks essentially something like this. Um, and most of what we're dealing with is, is down here. Yes. Uh, Giga bear, uh, wait. Uh, giga barrels, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the height of each rectangle? Is that like a range of costs? Yeah, exactly. Um, so there's also okay. So the the height of this represents the uncertainty range around the cost of production. So it can vary. I mean, even even within like one type of fuel, like if we're just talking about conventional oil, you know, some of it can can still be less costly than than others, and so that represents kind of the the approximate range um, of of um, producing. And then the other part of it is the the shaded green represents your sort of reserves and resources. So who knows. The, did we talk about this? Who knows the difference between a reserve and a resource? Yes. Reserve is what you can prove to like basically, like, like you know you have it. And resources essentially like the quantity exists, but is it economically viable? Yeah. So this, like the dark green, is essentially stuff that we know we can get, and the light green, the resources, are sort of theoretically possible, but um, may or may not be. Uh, economic to to extract. Okay, any other questions? Oh yeah, sorry. The what we've already consumed that is only conventional, but doesn't include any of the other options as well. Maybe it might be a tiny, tiny fraction. Yeah, like very small. Like it would be. It might be probably. Uh, too small to appear on 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 the plot. Essentially, yeah. Uh, chemistry. <laughs> it's it's um, yeah. I don't actually know the chemistry, but I do know you know most most of this stuff is fairly um, fairly theoretical. Like it's it's definitely you. We know how to do it in labs and everything, but the cost of doing that compared to, uh, you know, traditional ones means that from a commercial perspective, sin fuels isn't really, really a thing. You know, there's two different ones. And yes. Are all like lab-based or maybe any input from any type of oil? Maybe a fraction of them comes from... Oh, no, so this is a... So uh, GTL and CTL is where you do a conversion. So you still need to start, right? So, so sin fuels, you're still trying to get to a right, the, essentially the right length carbon chain, right? And so for GTL, um, you're taking uh, carbon-based gases, right? And you're basically trying to combine them up to, let's say, like a C8 if you want to make like gasoline. Um, or for a CTL, which is coal, you are trying to break that apart into sort of, again, the right length um, carbon chains. So you still are starting, your starting point is still um, essentially some kind of fossil fuel. Yeah. Any other questions?
Okay. All right, so what is peak oil? So if you think about it, the, the sort of general concept, right, is that you have some, like oil is a finite resource on our planet, right? And so we go to extract it, right? And at some point through your extraction process, like uh, looking at sort of the cumulative amount of, of oil in the ground, you will reach, uh, you will reach a point where um, the production of that resource reaches its maximum, right? Um, and after that peak, your production will, um, will decline. So that is, that is in essence related to your ability to produce that uh, resource. Um, and generally people theorize that it's like around 50% once, um, once you get up to the like easiest first half then the latter half becomes more difficult um, and your production will um, tend, tend to fall off, right? So that's the sort of general concept of uh, peak oil. So in the US um, prior to the 2000s, um, some people sort of believe that we had hit peak oil in the 1970s, um, but then following the um, the discovery and ability to extract the resources from uh, shale, there has been sort of a resurgence, right? And so this, the concept itself of peak oil can uh, change, right? If you, um, if you are able to go from sorts of resources to reserves, um, that, that in itself can be sort of flexible, which, uh, yeah, changes changes the way that we think about um, uh, peak oil product. Um, whether we think that peak oil has has been sort of reached, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't think they've increased much. Um, yeah, as a as a result of of Trump policies, is that your? I mean, I'm, so I work at this. Okay. Hundred percent politically I'm unaffiliated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So maybe you should give the first half of the lecture. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well, you definitely let me know if I'm speaking. Uh, if I'm if I'm misinterpreting anything, this is not my my area of uh, expertise. What do you actually do in the industry? I'm a building engineer. Okay. So I build and build and rigs up there. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um. So as I mentioned, so part of that um, change in production has been thanks to um, the development of hydraulic fracturing, right? This is something that we talked about with um, big changes in uh, the natural gas industry over the last sort of two decades uh, or a decade and a half. Uh, and so similar type of thing happening uh, had happened with um, uh, crude oil, right? So, so shale um, shale resources doesn't only provide natural gas. There's also um, oil uh, available from um, from these resources. So, oil production. You can see the sort of proportion um, of production uh, domestically um, has has shifted quite a bit um, in terms of how much is being produced from non-hydraulic non versus uh, hydraulically fractured wells. Um, that's, that's also sort of um, changed 
the U.S. the U.S.'s um, sort of trade of these resources. They change from a net importer uh, of um, of these fuels to a, a, an exporter. So I talked. I mentioned briefly about some of the sort of volatility uh, around oil prices. Um, you can see some of that here. Um, and so you're talking about from a, from a sort of resource perspective, um, fluctuations that occasionally happen that can range in, in over sort of an order um, or, not, or slightly less than a, than a order of magnitude, right? And so this was um, back in the 1970s. Um, so if you remember um, learning about this in like history class, right? So the, the oil shocks in, in the 1970s that led to um, lots of policy, energy policy development in the US, um, that was pretty important. And then more recently, um, thinking about uh, disruptions in uh, corona, uh, disruptions to prices as a result um, of the pandemic. Um, there was, <laughs> uh, there was even a, I'm sure a lot of you guys remember this from the news a couple of years ago, um, the futures prices for oil actually went negative, which um, is a pretty interesting phenomenon, uh, but generally has sort of risen back up um, and actually has uh, increased beyond a lot of the sort of average prices before, um, before the pandemic. Uh, and there are lots of sort of different um, reasons for this. Uh, a lot of it having to do with the sort of power that, um, that OPEC exerts on sort of the general uh, market for, for this fuel. Yes. These two are different prices and each has a bunch of suppliers worldwide. Yeah. Uh, no, so these, um, so West, West Texas Intermediate and Brent are two, um, what, what is the best way to describe? Different yeah. To, Texas, yeah. And, and they get the, the U.S. oil, the U.S. North America, and then Brent does you'll see, typically oil, is, it's, it's all relative to similar chemistry, but West Texas Intermediate, it's a lighter crude. So it's just from the general area, so it's similarly chemically, so they can sell it as one barrel of oil versus brands slightly heavier, slightly different chemical composition, and so it gets sold in the market at more of a similar speed. So brands not being sold. And the and like the supply, they have sort of in independent supply chains, right? Yeah. A lot of times, uh, you can't take what a lot of refineries like downstream. You can't take West Texas Intermediate and put it into a refinery that was built for Brent crude, or for like heavier sands from like Canadian tar sand, from Venezuelan heavy oil. You have to kind of tailor your refineries to the sweep the chemical supply. So OPEC is mainly Brent. No, no, is their yeah. own. Uh, they have their own pocket. Uh, it's like a basket. So if you like look up oil prices, okay. like OPEC. Basket, I saw for a little salt. Anyway, so it's like the third big Yeah, so yeah, so like you have Russia, Russia and Saudi Arabia, the two largest net exporters of oil. The Russians like the Uralis barrels, I want to say. And then, like I said, Saudi Arabia, they kind of just traded the OPEC basket. And so, uh, you know, it's basically who your market. Who are you buying it? Where are you buying it from? Where are you shipping it? What's the price of shipping? Is it cheaper to buy cheap oil in America? You see, like the blue line tends to be lower than Brent. So if you're in Europe, is it cheaper to buy West Texas Intermediate and then have it shipped, or is it cheaper to buy more expensive oil? And you'll have to change your refineries to some degree your systems to adapt. Exactly. So it's pretty much set. Exactly. For yeah. Do you also get more energy? Uh, 
I would say no. I mean, they relatively are all the same BTUs for, or just maybe it's like the like the sulfur content, kind of other chemical compounds that are in it that are uh, more drive uh, the chemical differences. But in the end, it's typically the same, like carbon chain link. Yeah. So these are different like engine types, so like aircraft oil, like jet fuel, like you can set the car, not like when you put car fuel in the so it's like jet. Just, so it's like some of these are like West Texas, you got like like depending on the kind of competition, like yeah, find a certain way to get a certain type of oil. So some supply chains you only use jet. Like, only I want to make it different to have my market because like it's a true need. Of yeah, so it's very different. specific. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if both oils have different use cases, um, I wouldn't have expected the like the curves to look that similar. Like why I, I would have, until you said that I would have thought that basically substitute there. only important until you are like at the refinery mm -hmm. because like the markets you have to do them always below, but basically all the charts can try to Yeah, so they're they're not they're um you, even though the oil composition um, from these different markets are sort of slightly different, they're not like totally different, like just complements, right? So we think about, so, okay, like right here. So petroleum, right, is on average sort of broken down into like these different sort of compounds. You can think of essentially you've got this big barrel um, that has a mixture of uh, carbons that have, at different chain lengths, right? Um, and so the the sort of percentage of you know these different things and um, the sort of uh, um, what is the word uh, other like the the percentage of other like non carbon um, compounds in there they can be different um, within within your sort of different types of oils. Um, which might let you get like slightly more gasoline out of one or, or slightly more, you know, aviation fuel out of another, but it, it doesn't mean like the ones that you extract from this market are only going to be for aircraft and the ones that you extract from this market are only going to be for like gasoline for cars. Um, and so because you've, uh, because of that, um, the, the oil prices are, are going to be sort of a little bit more sort of closely linked. And so that also relates to, um, you know, you can imagine that different different markets. Um, so so the prices that are getting set by a particular market are going to be tied closely to you know prices um, of of oil in, in other markets. And so imagine hypothetically that like. Well, the, the WTI and Brent um, only constituted like, like a small fraction, like let's say like 1% of the market and then 99% of it was, um, the rest of it was like OPEC, hypothetically, right? So then um, it would be really difficult, right? For, for these guys to kind of stray too far from prices that like OPEC might set, right? And so the supply um, sort of to a degree um, is connected to kind of the, the market power that you exert in terms of the like economics and pricing of, of the fuel, right? And so, um, West Texas Intermediate and Brent could not simply just like push their prices up because then we'd start buying oil from other other markets. Yeah. So the case that maybe forward market prices show more of a divergence between the two curves, and as we get to the spot prices, the arbitrage the arbitrage opportunity equalizes, so you get lower prices. Uh, huh? Yeah, I'd have to think about that. Um. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Well, but you're using you're using like that might be true if like you're using the type of oil in heavier like concentrations and stuff like that. But because you're using these are cars, these are planes, you're manufacturing heavier and 
generally speaking, right, like you wouldn't like the consumer world in large, you're not going to see like a massive like revenue shift, right? Just because they're doing the same thing as well. So if you would say, for instance, like I don't know, like manufactured things X percentage more in like this part in like Southeast Asia, right? And you had these rent, you might see the rent price diverge from WTI in a like spatial, spatially specific spot, right? But like if you're doing global, they're going to stick pretty close together because you do the same thing everywhere else. Yeah, I think I think just in general, there are nuanced reasons for why like prices uh, diverge and nuanced reasons for like this difference, right? But generally speaking, um, despite the differences, it's it, it's generally a like homogenous sort of pro. Um, uh, it's generally a it's relatively homogenous commodity, and so the prices will never really differ that much. Yeah. Um, so from uh, from a perspective of, of thinking about sort of policies um, pushing us uh, to think about climate change and and mitigation, right? Reducing fuel use, um, actually, pandemics might be a great way to to think about lowering demand. So being a little facetious here, but um, there was a really sort of unprecedented drop in in demand right at the sort of early stages of the pandemic um which is yeah more more um more in terms of sort of quantity than any any policy has has ever um has ever successfully sort of done in terms of affecting on the demand side it was kind of interesting um okay Petroleum processing. Uh, so this is a really sort of high level uh, overview of the sort of supply chain of going from your oil to essentially what you're going to get at your gas station, right? And so um, we're talking about uh, things like diesel or gasoline, which is a refined product, uh, byproduct of um, oil refining. Right, or I shouldn't say byproduct. It is the product of, of one of the products of, of refining, right? And so you can think about uh, whether the oil is imported or domestically um, produced, getting sent into a refinery, going to storage, right? And then um, you can also import refined gasoline, um, which also can be part of that uh, process. Uh, and then you have a sort of large scale sort of distribution system to get uh, all of that fuel basically to um, your endpoint. So they first get stored in these fuel terminals. So these are bulk storage terminals uh, that exist sort of around the country. This is like the last step before it goes to the gas station. Um, there are about 30 uh, bulk storage terminals in California and a couple hundred across the US. Uh, and eventually that then gets shipped to um, your, your gas stations. Okay, chemistry, we talked about this uh, briefly. So um, the alkanes I was talking about, these are the sort of carbon chains um, that constitute a lot of the most of the fuel um, that you use. So the shorter, the, the shorter-ish ones, these are from uh, pentane up to uh, octane, C5 to C8s. This is mainly what you'd be using in gasoline. Um, so the volume of a barrel uh, of, of oil, that's 42 gallons. So average-ish, right? Again, the compositions change depending on, on where the oil is coming from, but you're talking about 20-ish gallons of gasoline per uh, barrel of oil. Um, as the chains get sort of longer and longer, right, you, you can think of the liquids getting sort of um, more um, viscous, right? Um, so now you're talking about things like diesel, kerosene, jet fuel. So these are from 
the carbon um, chains length nine up to 16. Uh, beyond that, you're talking about fuel oils, lubricating oils up to sort of waxes. And then even beyond that, um, they use these super long carbon chains for like asphalt. Like, what was it? Like 400 or 500, something like that, I think. Don't quote me on that. I don't know if uh, anyone else knows. What's the split of how much domestic oil do we actually consume domestically and how much do we export? So the gasoline that's in the tanks, is it, what's the split? Is it mostly exported or domestically produced? How does that play? All right, so you're talking, so the gasoline in our cars, how much of that is domestically, uh, you're talking about produced or refined? Uh, I'd say how much domestically produced and refined and how much comes exported and then refined and then. All right, I'm going to turn to our resident expert. Do you know these numbers? If I'm not mistaken, you can't actually sell, to not sell refined petroleum products out of the U.S. So if it's mostly gas in the U.S., it's actually going to stick in the U.S. market. So we sell to bring in oil. Uh, we can still import refined products. We can still import oil to like uh, Italy, Greece, China, and stuff. But I think it's something like U.S.'s demand is probably uh, it's weird. Here's the thing: so we can export oil, but we actually are still like a net. And we're pretty much like break even because it's, it's like 50-50, right? We can uh -huh. sell. You can sell more money. You can sell your same oil to produce in America, but you can make more money selling it overseas. You will, as opposed to just keeping it in the U.S. market. Um, but it's relatively break even. Yeah. So it used to be like. 80, 20 ish, like a decade and a half ago, right? Like in terms of 80 imports. Yeah. Uh, but now, yeah, I wanted to say roughly 50 50. Um, yeah. And, and actually, the refining can be like different, um, even sort of locally within the US. So, like, California has strict rules about, um, about the uh, carbon content of, um, their, their gasoline, right, LCFS. Um, and so the gasoline in California is actually different than the gasoline in, in other states. Um, that's also why it's more expensive. Um, okay, so it is, it is not a sort of uniform, so gasoline, after even after it's refined, is not just a uniform, um, uh, fuel. It's actually a mixture of a bunch of sort of small hydrocarbons. Um, they vary between four to 12 carbons um, per molecule, but generally you're talking about C8 um, in, in gasoline. Energy density, 45 megajoules per kilogram. It's actually, a, you know, if you recall back to um, our very first lecture um, about energy this is actually a fairly energy dense fuel, right? Which is why it lets you move around this like one ton steel object uh, very, very easily or relatively easily. Um, and then we've, we've already looked at the sort of total reserve numbers. Um, world consumes uh, about, um, Four times, yeah, four times ten to the eleventh, which would be uh, four hundred billion uh, gallons of uh, gasoline per year. Um, the way this is used, uh, unlike most of the other sort of energy production um, methods that we've looked at in the class, right, which is basically uh, electricity generation, getting a turbine to spin, um, we, engines, uh, gasoline engines, diesel engines use uh, a different type of thermodynamic cycle. Um, so this is a uh, simplified uh, or, or a simple representation of what you would see in a typical sort of spark ignition piston engine. Um, real engines today use a 
more sort of complex thermodynamic cycle, but generally it's going to look something like this. Um, so you have different phases of your thermodynamic cycle. You don't need to worry about sort of memorizing this or anything. Um, but generally, uh, the theoretical limit of these types of thermodynamic cycles is around um, high 50s to low 60s percent. Um, but in real world terms, we're usually getting something uh, closer to 30, 35% efficient. Questions about this? Okay. So let's see how this actually um, plays out uh, in, a, in a real world um, application. So this is, this is basically a representation of that thermodynamic cycle. Uh, and so this is the type of thing that would be happening inside of your, your car engine. So this, um, this is known as the four stroke cycle. Um, so this is your piston assembly. Uh, and so you can see there's four stages here, which is why it's called the four stroke cycle. And what essentially is happening so in your first stage, uh, a valve will open up. And what, that, what happens there is that uh, air is sucked into the cylinder. And so that's the first stage, the blue, where you see the like blue thing coming in. You'll also notice these like little dots um, that are coming from this piece here, which is the fuel injector. And so that fuel injector is uh, essentially uh, aspirating spraying gasoline into your um, piston chamber. The second stage is when this piston sort of moves up uh, and what happens there, all the valves close. And so as the piston moves up, it's compressing the um, mixture of your fuel and air. Uh, and that allows for better power delivery and efficiency of your um, combustion process. So in the third part of it, um, this piece right here, which is the spark plug, will ignite the fuel air mixture inside of the piston chamber. So you're literally creating this like miniature explosion right inside of that um, chamber. Uh, and that leads to um, the power stroke. And so the combustion will push, push your piston down. Um, and that is where your, um, that is the conversion of your chemical energy into uh, mechanical energy, your kinetic energy, right? Uh, through the motion of the piston going down. And the last stage is the exhaust stroke where uh, an exhaust port opens up uh, which will essentially suck out um, the combustion byproducts of your um, fuel ignition. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, uh, I, let me, I will get to that actually. So there is, um, to, to, just to be extra clear, so there's um, a hybrid vehicle and then there's a plug-in hybrid vehicle. So a hybrid vehicle uh, is a, a vehicle that is extra efficient because it has a large battery that allows it to do things like regenerative braking um, and start stop idling and, and that sort of thing. But importantly, none, none of the actual um, drivetrain is powered by the battery. So for a typical hybrid vehicle, so if you think about the classic example of the Prius, that is a gas car. Um, it is not, strictly speaking, an electric vehicle in the sense that, that we'll be talking about electric vehicles. Do you also have a question? Yeah, that's right. So diesel engines um, are a little bit different. So um, like they have a auto ignition, for example, so you don't need to um, manually, well, manually combust the, the fuel. Um, yeah, so they'll operate slightly differently. Yeah. 
Okay, so so what is happening in that system? So essentially the mechanical energy getting transferred up and down. So that linear energy gets transferred into rotational energy through um, the spinning of these cams. So that spins um, this, uh, this can uh, crank, crankshaft. Uh, the crankshaft then spins this thing here up at the front. This is your timing belt. And what the timing belt does is, if you look up at the top here, it rotates a camshaft um, where you have these cams that are, um, which are essentially timed to rotate and um, open up those valves, um, as I was mentioning before, in each of the stages. And so because it's all sort of discreetly connected, um, you'll never have sort of mistimings, well, I shouldn't say never, but um, essentially this, this allows you to time the, um, each of the strokes correctly throughout the whole engine assembly. Uh, this will eventually get connected into your transmission system in the back, which eventually translates the motion into your, into your wheels. Um, when you look at the RPMs when you're driving a gas car, right? Um, that is in reference to the revolutions per minute um, of, of these shafts, not of your, not of your wheels. Um, and so you, you can get, um, right, you can think about how, how many sort of mini explosions are essentially happening and how fast this is rotating. Um, in reference to those numbers that you might be seeing from your um, from your speedometer. Yes. It's one rotation of the crankshaft. So this this thing here. Yeah. So that would be uh, two, I think, um, per four strokes. Yeah. Um, the, if you've heard of like a, like a V6 or V8 or V12 engine, that just means, um, the configuration of your pistons um, can be sort of parallelized in a like V orientation. And then the number refers to the number of pistons in, in the engine. And generally speaking, um, the more pistons that you have, the sort of smoother the, the operation of, of the engine. Okay, so basics uh, of the fuel system. So the fuel injectors, um, these will spray the fuel in at the right time in a, in a fairly sort of efficient manner. So anyone know what they used before fuel injectors? Carburetor, yeah, right, which is um, a lot less uh, efficient way to sort of dispense the, the fuels. The octane rating um, refers to the resistance of the engine to auto ignition. And so what that is, if, if I go back to this step actually, so um, in the power stroke, there's a, the spark plug ignites the fuel, right? But you can imagine that if this process, if the process, if the, if the, the piston itself gets hot enough, um, the fuel might combust um, before the spark plug um, ignites the, the mixture. And so that can be, for example, that might happen like in the compression stroke as you're like pressurizing it. And then the, the piston itself is so hot that it causes the fuel mixture to combust early. Um, and so that's really bad for the engine. So having a a higher octane rating 
um, essentially reduces the um, the the reduces the chances that that will happen because the um, the point at which your fuel mixture ignites has to happen sort of essentially at a higher temperature. You need a little bit more sort of uh, initial energy. Um, <clears throat> so when that happens, um, it's called engine knocking and generally is destructive to the engine. But um, generally the only times this is gonna happen is if you have like a really high performance uh, engine. And so if you think about like luxury cars uh, or like sports cars, um, that's more often when you'll need to get like higher octane rating gas. And so for most cars, it's totally fine to use um, lower octane rating fuels. Um, and, and really this stuff is not gonna affect your fuel efficiency. I think that's like one of the most common misconceptions of uh, different octane ratings. Um, it's really just for uh, preventing auto ignition. So combusting fuels, you need, um, you need your fuel, but you also need oxygen, right? That's how combustion happens. Uh, and so the ratio of gas to oxygen in an engine is about one to 14. So for a 20 gallon tank, um, you're consuming something like 20,000 cubic feet of oxygen. Um, and you can think about what that means for what's coming out of the tailpipe too, right? Because that's all, all of that is getting uh, essentially converted to, to CO2. Uh, some stuff about oil, right? So this is mainly to lubricate parts of the engine. Um, if it's not sort of well lubricated, in increases friction, can get too hot, um, right? Leads to accelerated degradation of your, of your engine. Engines, um, you wanna keep them from getting too hot and you also wanna get, keep them from uh, getting too cold. Um, and so you've got um, systems that, that deal with that as well. Uh, and the last one, yeah, so the spark plug itself um, is connected to um, this distributor, which allows them to fire in, in a certain sequence at the right time. Um, all of this is connected to the battery, um, which is a fairly sort of, uh, not a very sort of energy intensive system. The battery is also used to power other sort of electronics in, in your vehicle, but until, um, until you get to uh, issues of actually Powering the drivetrain, you don't really need that large of a, of a battery for, for your vehicle. Uh, okay. Any questions about uh, what's car stuff? The energy oh, I have no idea. <laughs> Does anyone, anyone know that? Like 12 volt batteries. So yeah, it's like very. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's not like you need a constant like energy, like large amount of energy input, right? It's just like, just to get over the initial hump to, um, of input energy required to activate your, your combustion. So this, this really isn't like, um, a, an, a, an energy intensive, um, process like your, yeah, yeah. Your like lights are definitely going to be, um, and, and your, uh, like AC are going to take way more electricity. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, do I have, I lied, last one. Um, so let me, let me get to that in just a second. So what happens after the exhaust, it goes through this uh, manifold 
um, it gets sent through uh, two critical pieces. Um, so you've got a catalytic converter. Um, and so why, why do we have that? So in your combustion process, you're, you're taking gasoline and you're combusting it. And ideally, if, um, like if the fuel were just hydrocarbons and your air mix and your and the air that you were injecting was pure oxygen and everything was happening at the like ideal temperature, then the only byproduct you would have is CO2, right? But um, your air, the air mixture going into your vehicle, right, is just uh, our air that we're, you know, um, living in, which is not just oxygen, right? There's lots of other, um, lots of other compounds, right? So you have uh, nitrogen as well. Um, and then if there are impurities within the gasoline, uh, then you could also uh, get other sorts of byproducts. And, and if the conditions in which it's combusting is not um, ideal, you might have things like incomplete combustion, um, other sorts of byproducts, right? And so those, a lot of those result in, um, pollution, particulate, uh, air pollution, particulate matters that they try to reduce as much as possible in your catalytic uh, converter. So the, the composition, I don't know the exact like chemical composition of catalytic converters, but they do contain um, sort of expensive metals. So things like uh, platinum, um, I think sometimes uh, some can have like palladium, yeah. Um, uh, that's why you have this string of like thefts of catalytic converters um, because there's uh, expensive materials in there. Uh, the last piece that this goes through is the muffler, which is designed to sort of reduce um, the, the noise of the gas getting expelled out of the, um, out of the vehicle you've ever driven around without a muffler, it's extremely loud. Yeah, my, when I was living, when I was in grad school, I was driving this old Honda Civic and my muffler fell off because the salt from the roads like rusted it. And it was like, oh yeah, I'm like driving a race car, a very slow race car. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm not really gonna talk about transmissions. There are like entire classes that you could take on just transmissions um, that you can think of it like a fancy, like bike gears, right? Essentially uh, it's a system of gears that allow you to um, uh, change the, the rotational uh, speed uh, coming out of the crankshaft of your engine into a different speed that you want your wheels to be turning. Uh, that's connected um, to your to your drive shaft, which is uh, going out to your wheels. Um, okay, and that is uh, from sort of the the beginning of the uh, fuel resource all the way to getting to our um, endpoint of translating into uh, mechanical uh, energy, right? To get the mobility that that we want. Sorry, what was that? This thing? Yeah, so that's, um, this is, yeah, yeah, that's right. To, to essentially get everything from the transmission to, to your uh, wheel assembly. Um, yeah, so, a lot of the details of the, the types of things that we're covering, right? Um, this is a, at a fairly high level, but for the class, we kind of want to reduce uh, as we as we as we go to these like higher system level things. Um, we're reducing the the resolution of knowledge um, for these sort of specific um, specific systems, but we, we wanna make sure that it's not a sort of total black box for, for everyone, especially for those who are like less familiar with, um, with specifics in, in any of the things that, that we've been talking about, right? And so, um, 
yeah, if, if any, if, if it comes up in any particular work that you're doing where you need sort of more details, um, there are other resources to get a lot more fine tuned with some of the topics that, that we've covered. Um, or you can, you can ask me and I can point you to some, some of those resources. Okay, non-fossil fuels for transportation. So this is closer to my uh, wheelhouse now. So electrifying vehicles, um, does anyone know the first, when the first electric vehicle was invented? Yeah. It's like a late 1800s, early 1900s. There's charging stuff. Uh, yeah, actually, early 1800s was the first one. They preceded, um, preceded the first gas cars, which was in the late 1800s. Um, how about the, the first modern electric vehicles? Anyone know? The 90s, yeah. So the EV1, um, which is a car designed by uh, GM, came out in the mid 90s uh, and was powered initially by lead acid batteries. Um, very, uh, very low energy density relative to a lot of the sort of modern batteries that we think about today. Also very heavy. So these vehicles weighed a ton. Um, they were so heavy that actually difficult to, um, they put a lot of strain on, on brakes actually. The sort of next generation, and actually the, the, the sort of later versions of the EV1 uh, used nickel metal hydride batteries, but these really came into prominence with uh, hybrid vehicles. Uh, so specifically, um, the sort of first couple generations of uh, hybrids, uh, notably including the Toyota Prius, used these uh, nickel metal hydride batteries which had better energy and power density um, than your, your old lead acid batteries. And then nowadays, right, we have lithium ion batteries, which is still a um, generic uh, representation actually of several different chemistries of batteries that are used in electric vehicles. Um, and so this is the technology um, that has really sort of Propelled, uh, propelled electric vehicles in the sense that the characteristics of lithium ion batteries in terms of how much energy they can pr provide and how much power output they can provide enables us to actually um, compete against uh, modern, modern day vehicles. And there's still questions about economics, which we'll, we'll get into, but yeah, so this is kind of our next generation or our current generation. And there might be different chemistries in the future. Um, a lot of those might still be getting worked out in like R&D sort of lab level, um, but not that doesn't necessarily mean that lithium ion batteries are like the only, uh, only chemistry that will be getting used in, in EVs in the future. Okay. So batteries, so batteries are a form of energy storage. So unlike everything we've talked about in the last three lectures, um, this isn't something that produces energy itself. Um, well, it does produce energy, but you have to put energy in first. Um, so essentially the way this works is that you have a sort of potential difference between your um, cathode and your anode, and you allow sort of ions to travel uh, between them that sort of uh, completes a, a circuit that allows electricity to flow through um, some kind of load. And, and so that's generally how, how batteries will work. Um, and lithium batteries themselves, the only sort of different thing is the sort of chemistry and makeup of the components of the battery. So, you, so the anode has a specific type of chemistry. Your cathode has a specific type of chemistry. And in order for this type of technology um, to compete against your traditional gas car, right? You need uh, you need it to be small enough, right, to fit in your car and not take up too much room. 
it's got to be light enough that um, that you're not just using the all of the energy coming out the battery just to move the battery itself. Um, it needs to have a good energy density. And so what does that translate to in a vehicle? That That's really talking about the range of the vehicle. So if the battery can only drive your vehicle for 10 miles, right, that's not going to be a really good um, competition against what we use today. Uh, and then it has to have good uh, power density, right? So it actually has to be able to move the vehicle up to fast speeds that you that you would again want um, uh, that you would want in in your vehicle to compete against these uh, everyday cars, right? And so these fundamental sort of characteristics um, drive a lot of the sort of design characteristics of uh, of your batteries uh, and the technology had to progress to a certain point in, able, in order to get all of these things um, to be able to, to be used in a modern day vehicle. Yeah. Are there for a lifespan? For, sorry, what? Lifespan. lifespan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I should have that here too, right? And so you don't want the battery to die after a year. Um, and so that, that has also played uh, an important role in the development too. And there's a lot of sort of interesting policy around um, lifetime of batteries, particularly for, for vehicles, yeah. Uh, what's the uh, energy density of gasoline? Um, yeah, so how many uh, watt hours per liter? Um, so you can do a high level sort of translation of this, right? And so, um, so this energy density, let's say 500 watt hours per liter um, will get you to something like a 300 mile range for um, a certain, um, certain size battery. Uh, we can do that. 8.9 kilowatt hours per liter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So more than an order of magnitude, which you could you could work out. Uh, you you could work even even without looking it up. You could you could work it out from these general numbers, right? Um, you can think about what that would translate to in terms of like a comparable gas car with a similar sort of range, and yeah. Oh, that's the um, it depends. Well, it, it generally in the NMC. In NMC, I don't actually. I don't know off the top of my head. Does anyone know what the electrolytes are? No. Um, I can. I can look that up. People mainly. Uh, most of the discussion is around cathode uh, and anode material um, and separator, um, which is a lot of like uh, graphite that they that they need for for um, for these things. But actually, I don't know too much about the electrolytes. Um, Okay, economics. Um, this is a pretty um, pretty famous plot coming from a, a Nature Climate Change paper that was published in 2014. Uh, so let me kind of walk through what we're looking at here. So this is essentially the authors of this paper went around. And they asked a bunch of experts. So in academia, in the industry itself, um, about what uh, what the prices for um, for battery lithium ion uh, battery cells were. Okay, and so that is so the those sorry not prices so cost to produce a cell per so per kilowatt hour. So 
these costs are shown on the y-axis here. And there is naturally sort of a range, right? Um, difference, um, production methods, different companies um, and different studies will have sort of difference, um, different costs associated with production of these lithium ion battery cells. And then uh, they also asked the experts to sort of project what the uh, cost of production of these would be out into the future. And so this is what people were talking about, sort of short term, um, a little bit longer term, and then sort of decadal decreases. So this is sort of the a representation of all of the, not all, but a, a good representation of um, experts in the field. Uh, and then this red bar here um, represents $150 per kilowatt hour um, per, per cell. And that cost is sort of a rough, um, a rough cost that folks have agreed uh, would essentially let you break even on the cost of your electric vehicle compared to a gas car um, over its entire lifetime. So when you go to buy the EV, it's still more expensive than a gas car, but because electricity on average is cheaper than gasoline, um, you would start making your money back. And so at $150 per kilowatt hour, you would break even over the lifetime of both of those vehicles. Um, we don't really talk about 150 anymore because we've passed that um, as of several years ago. Um, we're currently sort of like 120, 130 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Was that? That's that's about right. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what sources that you're looking at. No, no, I don't. Yeah, yeah. So also, so the other thing to keep in mind is that we're talking about the cell level, not the pack level. So the pack. So you're, you have multiple cells in the module and then multiple modules in a pack. And so the pack sometimes will have a little bit more stuff. Yeah. Um, so so the, the battery pack will, um, it'll have more things like a battery management system and other sort of controls. Um, so those tend to be a little slightly more expensive. Um, but anyways, uh, what you can see here though, is that none of the experts thought we would get it even by 2030, essentially. Um, and so people get it wrong, including people like me. So don't always listen to everything I'm saying. My guess, yeah. I was in grad school here, so I didn't have any guesses. I was, I didn't know what I was doing. No, I'm just, <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I didn't, I don't really do like battery economic stuff, um, but there are, are a couple of people here who, um, who are heavily ingrained in, in this, uh, in this area and they, they probably would know. Um, they'd probably have some, some good guesses, maybe better than these guys. Um, yeah. So the new, the new thing that people talk about is $85 per kilowatt hour which is in the same vein as this, it would be kind of the break even for EVs and gas cars at the point of purchase. So then they're no longer more expensive to buy when you go to the dealer. And then everything after that, you're just making more your money back because then the, because um, again, electricity is, is cheaper than, than gasoline. Okay, any questions about this? Um, yeah, so this is kind of what has happened since 2014. Um, we can see we passed 100, 150 just in a span of like three years after after this, right? So all of these all of these people were off by decades. <laughs> um, yeah, and currently sitting around uh, yeah 115. You said. Um, 
or actually it was lower, it was lower than it this is actually last year because of uh, supply constraints was actually the first year that uh, prices went up a little bit but like just a little bit don't worry about it too much it'll come back down uh, I'll, I, I'll bet money on that one Dude. <laughs> uh, where is the where are battery production happening um, you can see big explosion in in China their sort of EV market is uh, particularly strong um, and that's sort of at the cell level and then at the uh, a lot of the battery packs are actually um, uh, assembled in uh, in um, China and the US it's kind of hard to see yeah like the color is hard to see <laughs> maybe it's clear on here yeah a little bit um, Okay. Huh? This breakdown? Yeah. Where does Oh oh oh. Um. Actually, <laughs> annual capacity by. Wait, this is, this seems not correct. No, no, no. Okay, my bad. I'm looking. So I just realized um, what I'm uh, what I'm looking at here. So this is four batteries in uh, in the U.S. Yeah. So this is all U.S. All of this is U.S. Um, we don't actually get we don't actually get much from from China. But if you look at the worldwide production, sorry, I. <laughs> Uh, I didn't. So for vehicles that are purchased or manufactured in the US or like delivered in the US. Right? Yes, exactly. So the the bulk of the battery production um, is in the US or imported from Japan and Korea. Uh, and so, yeah, so I think about like Panasonic, Samsung, those are big players in the battery. Uh, cell world. So those get imported here and then we construct the packs. So the vast majority of battery packs are um, produced in the US. Very small amount from China. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and there's been a big push to sort of fully integrate the supply chain domestically. Um, so for those who've been following uh, the In Inflation Reduction Act, right, that has been a big policy push for uh, domestic production. This is a nice little plot that was just released by the Department of Energy, um, looking at supply chain investments um, of battery either production or they have some processing and recycling um, of, of, of batteries as well. But a huge amount of money going into this. Uh, and you can see where a lot of the, that is happening across the states, yeah. To get built and like up and running fast, yeah, like a year, yeah. Um, These are also like um, in, in the IRA as a tax credit. Vehicles, there's like a certain, like a stepwise, there's a certain amount of minerals that have to actually mine and then develop and then manufacture in the United States. And so it kicks in in like 2025. 2024. 2024. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's. Tesla has already produced everything in the US. They always qualify for nearly. Except for like the lithium. Um, they do most of it in Reno. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, they, we don't know for certain if Tesla will qualify for everything. Um, the, the, like the minerals? Yes. Aside from minerals, everything else is all 
nearly all built it, in the last few years. Because they build all this, the batteries and rings. Like a lot of the cells, like JD was like Panasonic was the, the Samsung and exited. But. It's slightly more, uh, it's slightly more complicated than that um, because uh, there's a question. So part of it is um, like the, the, the source of the battery components themselves all the way down to the initial, um, initial uh, area where any component might come from has to be domestic. Um, and so it's going to depend on the definitions from, from IRA that will eventually get uh, released. It is, uh, the treasury is doing that with, I'm not, I don't know if I'm allowed to say. Oh. <laughs> so I, I'm actually, I'm, um, I'm on a detail to the Department of um, Transportation for a year. So I'm involved with the you just turn this is being recorded. <laughs> uh, I'm working for the joint office right now, so I can tell you that there are activities happening around this. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, let's just say that there's uncertainty that about exactly who and what will qualify um, and, and until the treasury releases like concrete guidance on, on this, um, there's, a, there's, let's say there's a lot of speculation in like media and blogs and stuff like that. Um, but until everything's ironed out, like nobody, nobody really knows. Yeah. And that's all we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, so on to the vehicles themselves. So, yeah, from a from like an engineering perspective, actually, electric vehicles uh, we think of as, as this new technology, but um, but it's actually remarkably more simple than a traditional gas car. Okay, and so in in, a, in an electric vehicle, um, so I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but essentially you, you have a, a motor that's being powered by a battery, right? And so even in terms of like the moving parts, right, you've basically just got the, the motor spinning uh, your, your wheels, right? As opposed to uh, in the gas car, right? In the engine, you've got your like pistons, which are moving a camshaft which is moving like a timing belt, uh, goes into your transmission system. So mechanically way more complex than, um, than just a uh, electric vehicle. Uh, and, and, and again, it's a simplification, like the electric motors themselves start to get, um, you know, pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot of innovation and in technology that's gone into electric motors, even in the last, uh, last decade. Um, like Tesla has been sort of at the forefront uh, of, of the motor technologies. Um, but at, at the end of the day, like fewer things moving, uh, it's a lot sort of easier, um, easier to, to, to put together um, and sort of less issues with, um, with things like ma maintenance and operation and repair of, of these vehicles. Um, yeah, and so your battery pack, um, you have a, a charger port instead of your, um, your fuel tank uh, and um, the, the gas port. Um, you have an uh, onboard charger, so uh, batteries. Uh, so if you recall from the lecture the other day, so elect our electricity system operates in, in AC. Um, but batteries operate in, in DC, so you need to convert that electricity. Uh, and so you have like an onboard charger to do that. Um, and then you have some like thermal and battery management systems. Uh, but other than that, not, not too, too much more complicated. Yeah. Okay. 
it would make sense that electric cars in general are more expensive because the battery is more expensive. Yeah. Cheaper. Yeah. And the cars are still more expensive because of. No, no, no. So batteries are like way more expensive. Like the bulk of of the cost of an electric vehicle is like the battery. So, so yes, the batteries, um, uh, the the price of uh, and the cost of batteries has decreased over time, but not enough to make up the difference between gas cars and EVs. Um, and if we if we think about an electric vehicle today versus an electric vehicle 10 years ago, the cost of those batteries was, was way more expensive. Um, well, some of that cost differential is, has to do with like subsidies to um, automakers or automakers eating the cost of that extra uh, difference um, to, to try and reduce the price to the consumer. Um, and, you know, they could be doing that for like regulatory reasons, for example. Uh, and so, so still today, uh, there is generally a, a premium um, in terms of the, the price of, of buying an EV compared to a gas car, especially if you compare like to comparable cars, but that premium is continuing to shrink and there are still like policy interventions um, to help like the demand side still want to get people to buy them, right? So, you know, there's like a $7,500 credit uh, generally that you could that you could get if you bought a, a, a EV and that could make up the difference. Yes? How does the battery pack lead to the process? So what percentage of those, especially if you're operating with say, a higher power output and, and then how does, is that significant? Has that come down over time? As we went from lead acid to soybeans? So, okay. So, the technology, so lithium, nickel metal hydride to lithium ion batteries, um, when you're talking about like energy losses, um, it's not, that's, it's not really like a, characteristic of of like a difference in the in the chemistries right so that's more having to do with like how much energy like a lead acid battery or a nickel metal hydride battery or a lithium ion battery like just contains right and so you wouldn't be able to do this with a lead acid battery unless you filled like basically the entire car <laughs> right um but there are there are other sort of losses, right? So like passive losses, you're just if your car is just like sitting there and you just leave it there for like two years, your battery will drain a little bit, sure. Um yeah, yes. Yeah, that that's essentially what's happening, right? You can like if you think of the potential difference um between your anode and your cathode, like you're you're like leaking lithium ions sort of across um ac across your barrier and so that's yeah i guess you could call that self-discharge but it's it's relatively small okay and then and then other types of losses is like the the like energy content of the battery itself uh and that translating into like mechanical energy. And you could like calculate, right, the energy content and then the energy of like moving a vehicle of this weight, like what is that energy? And so you're, you'll have some losses there too, right? But that is like a small, a relatively small quantity in comparison to like a gas car where, um, so where, where are you losing your energy in, in your gas car? Yeah, combustion, right? So think about how hot your engine gets. Think about the heat out of the exhaust. All of that is energy that's lost, right? And so that energy compared to the fuel content of the fuel, that's like you're losing like 80% of the fuel energy. What's the number of the battery pack? So the battery pack, uh, it's like... Yeah, that might be a homework <laughs> question. Well, yeah. but like it, it's, it's you're on the order of like 80, 80 percent ish to ninety percent. Yeah, um, but.
but so think about why that is, right? So where does the electricity come from? Yeah. Oh, oh. Right. So, so your electricity comes from coal or oil, or it could come from like solar or wind or something like that, right? Um, but most of the losses when you go from your primary fuel, your secondary fuel, down to here, that's like usually the the biggest losses is, is your combustion stage. So people will talk about how EVs are way more efficient than a gas car, which is true, um, strictly speaking. Um, but if you do like the upstream life cycle efficiency, um, it gets closer, right? Because now you're talking about all the losses through your transmission system and all of that. It's still better because a turbine at a power plant, like at a gas plant, is like way more efficient than a gas engine. And so if that's the step where you're losing the most and you can conserve some there, at the end of the day, your EV is still going to be more efficient than a gas car, even accounting for the whole sort of life cycle. Yeah. Yes. Yep. The combustion of the fuel is where you're going to lose the most energy. And that is a question on the homework. Yeah. Yeah, so um, your DC-DC converter, so uh, you can have something uh, called a DC fast charger. Um, and so that is actually an external thing will convert the electricity from the grid into DC power, which gets injected into your vehicle. Um, but uh, it's operating at extremely high voltages, right? And so you need uh, to uh get to the right sort of voltage uh input for your for your battery yeah, yeah. uh yeah so like that part of it is like five ten percent ish yeah yeah small yep 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 um yeah, and that's that would be included in that number. So there are like different pieces of this. You're gonna have some. Uh, you'll have all the losses going all the way to the to the um, electric vehicle supply equipment. You connect in here. There will be some losses if you're converting either AC or DC to DC, um, uh, and and all of those losses from this point into the battery is like a couple percent. So you can tune like a whole process. It's a computer. So like you can, you can like integrate everything such that you can make sure that you can minimize losses from the past to the motor. And you can like Tesla has hundreds of them and other car companies. You can make sure like you have the perfect voltage for the battery in the yeah. like it's not mechanical. Yeah, well, but in, in the in the in the motor the motor itself is like that, that is the only moving thing part that you can seal that and so that can be like incredible yeah. compared to yes. So the battery direct current and motor AC for the motor or is it is the whole car direct current? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so your motor can be DC or AC, and there are, depending on which car company you choose, um, there are there are actually um, some car companies. So Tesla famously DC uh, motors, but um, I think the i3 uses an AC motor. Um, but they are they're starting to get yeah, it's yeah, it it depends. Um, yeah, I. I think a lot of people are moving to DC motors. You get more torque out of it. Yeah, there's. Yeah, there's that, but there are other trade offs, right? With with AC. Um, yeah. You know how to find control of it, I think. So you yep. couldn't, like, so it's like some cars, like, Williams have, like, DC motors for, like, each vehicle. So you can, like, actually control the output of the motor. 
if you had an AC motor, you could, yeah, exactly. Yep, yeah. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I have a whole, <laughs> I teach a different class, um, Introduction to Electric Vehicles, where I talk about this. Uh, I have like a whole lecture on motors, but we, don't have time to talk about that today. So, no, I don't know if it will be. I don't know if they're if they're gonna let me teach it. So, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay. Anyways, there are both AC motors and DC motors. Yep. Um, okay. Plug-in hybrids. So this is a um, this is your not a hybrid vehicle, a plug-in hybrid. So this would be like your Prius Prime or your Chevy Volt, which they don't make anymore. Um, what's the most popular one now? It's the Rally. Jeep. No, no, no. Oh, the, 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 the e. yeah, yeah. Four by E is like the best selling. It's ridiculous. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not ridiculous, it's all good. We, we want everyone to have an electric vehicle. Um, okay, so PHEV. Um, this combines both systems, okay? And so why would we do this? So there might be concerns about like range limitations, right? Um, and so a plug-in hybrid uh, will have a smaller battery pack, which lets you do a, a shorter range of travel with that vehicle. Uh, but then uh, it also has a um, full-size engine and a fuel tank that allows you to drive on gasoline as well. And so uh, essentially the idea here is, okay, well, the average, does anyone know how much the average American drives in the country per, per day? Yeah. It's a little higher than that. It's like 30-ish, 30-ish miles per day. Depends what state and yada, yada. But um, that's your average daily miles. And so if your battery pack is like, 30 miles or 50 or 60, right? Then you can uh, very comfortably do just most of your travel. Um, so there, they have these uh, utility factor curves, which is like, depending on your range, how much of how much of the driving would you be doing on electric versus gas? So like at 50 or 60 mile range, they're saying like two thirds of the miles that you're going to be doing are on electricity. Um, but yeah, these are the most complex systems, right? Because they have to have both. And then the sort of configuration and operation of the vehicle um, has a couple, there's a couple different configurations of this as well. So there's like a series, a parallel, and a, oh, actually I actually have a slide on this. Hang on, we'll get to that. Um, here we go. Uh, series, parallel, or both. And so uh, all this is, is um, your drivetrain is can only be powered by um, your electric motor uh, in uh, the series. And so the engine is actually powering a generator, which uh, fuel, uh, which provides electricity to your battery. Um, uh, but the engine itself does not um, provide any power into the drivetrain. So an example of this would be the i3 Rex, the range extender. Um, that is a series-based configuration. Um, you can have a parallel where you can either have the engine providing um, power into the drivetrain or your motor, um, or you could do a uh, series parallel. Um, and so like the later instantiation of the Chevy Volt, for example, use this, um, where you can have the um, generator going through your um, transmission system to actually power the motor. Um, or providing electricity to, to the battery. Okay. Um, so one of the things that we've been seeing um, developing over the years are trends where because the battery technology is improving, because the costs are coming down, um, you are basically enabling uh, electric vehicles in uh, larger format vehicles and increasing the range of vehicles as well, right? And so the first two um, 
sort of mass market vehicles, commercial vehicles, I would say, because this was preceded by like the Tesla Roadster and the Fisker Karma, but those are like really high end luxury cars, but um, your Chevy Volt and your Nissan Leaf. So that that's like a um, fairly compact, um, you know, sedan type category. Um, and your Nissan Leaf started with a 24 kilowatt hour battery, which is only 73 miles. Um, newer versions of it uh, came out later. So now they're up to 40 kilowatt hours, 150 miles, and there are 60 kilowatt hour versions of the Nissan Leaf as well. And the Chevy Volt, the second generation, increased up to uh, 53 miles from 35 miles. Um, huh? Uh, I did not include that here. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's on here too. This like this chart is already like fairly outdated, but you know. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh is that on here? Yeah, there it is up there. Um yeah. Back from the dead from the two thousand six. Yeah. Well, so but that's you know, uh different you guys are all piping up with different vehicles that, that you'd like to see, right? And, and so that's part of this, right? Is that um, the diversity and availability in, in like different styles and classes of vehicles is part of what's making this uh, technology more, more compelling. But it's taken some time, right? Um, you needed to get energy density and power density up high enough where you could start supporting, you know, SUV format, pickup truck format vehicles. Um, you wouldn't have been able to do that with the types of batteries that they had been putting in the first generation, like Leafs and, and Bolts, right? So now we're starting to see expansion into, into other classes. Um, okay. How much stuff do we have? Oh man, I went really slow today. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Um, maybe we'll finish up with uh, some of the charging infrastructure stuff. So infrastructure um, for conventional vehicles, right? Uh, you've got your gas station. And I think that this has been, this is one of the like pain points for a lot of people, especially for folks who haven't driven um, and, and used electric vehicles day to day, um, is that you can drive to a gas station and I can fill up uh, in, in five minutes, um, which you can't do, well, I say that, but it's getting a lot faster these days. It's harder to do that with, a, with an electric vehicle, right? Um, if you're, if you're charging at slower speeds, you're, you're talking more on the order of like hours rather than minutes. Um, but one of the nice things is that you can top up all the time. You can charge at home, you can charge at work, uh, and you can charge in places where you actually are spending time and that you want your vehicle to be sort of located at. So that's like a sort of counterfactual that, that fewer people like think about um, in, in the sort of transition to, to EVs, right? So if you think about like gas, who actually likes going to a gas station? Anyone? It's like I'm... <laughs> right. There's like a cultural thing too, but maybe they'll have that for EVs too. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a, it's a very sort of different uh, like concept to think about um, when you think about charging. Uh, types of charging connectors. Okay, so you've got uh, level one and two and then uh, DC fast, which some people call level three, which is like technically incorrect because level th there actually is a level three AC power, but that's, that's, more of a, that's more of like a European thing. It's not really gonna happen in the US. Uh, but yeah, DC fast. You'll hear this being called level three. Uh, ultra fast. Well, it's like uh, no, it's 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 ultra fast. There's extreme fast. There's a couple different versions of it. 
which is a nomenclature that falls under DC fast charging. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. So level one, um, your level one charger, just uh, that's your wall outlet right here. So if you, you can actually plug your car into that, you're getting about one kilowatt. That's about five to six miles of range in an hour. And that number is like very hazy because it depends on a, on a lot of things with your vehicle as well. Uh, level two, generally up to 20 kilowatts. That's the like standard for uh, level two. But typically you're talking about six to seven kilowatts. These days there are um, faster, uh, you, you can get a little bit higher. Um, vehicles have uh, faster charges in them now. So it's not uncommon for EVs in the last like two years or so. You're now talking nine, 10, 11 kilowatts. This is going to give you 25 to 30 miles per hour or, or like a little bit uh, higher than that, right? Up to like 50 miles per hour if you're, if you're doing like 10 kilowatts or so. DC fast charging. So these two are AC, DC fast charging. There are three standards, uh, CHADMO, CCS, and um, Tesla, basically. Um, Nissan and Kia are now kind of migrating over to CCS and Tesla is kind of um, being pushed to, to include CCS. They've been forced to do this in Europe um, and uh, they are converting, uh, retrofitting and new and station installs will have some CCS in, in there as well. Um, the fast charging here, uh, you're talking about anywhere, the sort of first generation is a lot of 50 kilowatts. Now you see a lot of 100, 120, 150. Um, and you can uh, also go all the way up to 350 kilowatts. Those are sort of common configurations. So these things will kind of charge your battery up, like let's say empty up to like 80% within uh, the, depending on, on the speed here, right between an hour down to like 15 minutes. Um, as I was mentioning, um, Chatmo, this is the configuration here. So Nissan and Kia, we're both using this and they are, a lot of their new vehicles are coming out with CCS and then Tesla has their own thing. Um, and even though it looks like a lot of car companies are CCS, there were a lot of CHADMO um, vehicles, uh, right? This doesn't speak to the volume of EVs being sold. One of the things that you have to navigate as a EV owner is like, there's a whole bunch of charging network providers, which is a total pain. So does anyone drive an electric vehicle? Yeah. Um, and do you have like a bunch of different apps on your phone? Yeah, I think I have like two folders on my iPhone that are just for like app providers to get a like scan. So this is actually, um, oh yeah, I know, Volta Shell. Also, who else is Shell? Um, there's another, yeah, Green Lots of Shell. Yeah, um, this is old. <laughs> I didn't bother updating this, this slide because why? Why bother? There, there's so many, there's, there's probably five times as more now than I have on here. Eas easily five times as more. Yeah, like some of these aren't in business anymore. Yeah, well, Blink. Blink has died and come back. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, anyways, so they're, like in Norway, their government required a standard so that everyone gets like a this key fob essentially that you can scan and it works for all providers but it's it's complicated actually yeah it's complicated i was thinking about what i'm allowed yeah i'm thinking about what i'm allowed to say <laughs> it's it's difficult and it's it's easier to do in a smaller country like norway yeah um a lot of chargers in the U.S. more than more than people might realize. Um, 
And there is uh, a lot of movement to sort of expanding this. Um, the, this is a representation of all public chargers, um, but a lot of these are going to be slower chargers. So like the density of, of DC fast chargers on the map is going to be a little bit smaller. Um, and these also include Tesla, which may not be available to everyone. Uh, a lot of the work that I do at the joint office is actually um, connected to um, NEVI, which is the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program that the federal government um, uh, put out as a result of the bipartisan infrastructure law in December of 2021. And that is developing a, a network of DC fast chargers um, basically across the country. And so that they put in $5 billion for that program plus another two and a half billion uh, to do like community and corridor charging um, throughout the country. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so good question. So how many gas stations are there in California? Does anyone know? <laughs> more, more than that. Does everyone have a rough idea and want to guess? 1,500. Uh, yeah, gas stations. 20,000, yeah. So there's 20,000 gas stations. How many chargers are there in California? Does anyone know? 300. No. 300. It's right now. Not DC fast chargers. He doesn't know. I'm doing the math right now. It's like a, uh, it's over a hundred, over a hundred thousand. Yeah. So we have five times more. But again, like public from public chargers, right? Um, which which is a slightly different format from from gas stations for DC fast chargers. You're we're nearing like 10k ish in California. Um, which are would be more comparable to a, a, a gas station, right? But like, yeah, yeah. Tesla has uh, about six thousand, and there's about four thousand. Yeah, um, yeah. Like on campus, for example, does anyone know how many chargers there are? Yeah, there's like. Yeah, you could look at uh, plug share for, for that information. So there's, yeah, no, they all work. I, I haven't had any problems charging on campus. Um, yeah, I can think of at least six locations on campus. So, and there's only like three gas stations in Davis, four gas stations in Davis. Uh, okay, anyways, so we'll end here. I still have some material. We'll, we'll pick off where we left off yes, uh, today um, on, on Wednesday. And then I'll stick around a little bit if anyone has any questions. Is it, is it why I just didn't want to take time